Uh, good morning and welcome to the third meeting of the Education and Culture Committee in 2014. Um, can I remind everyone who is present to switch off their mobile phones and any other electronic devices as they might affect the broadcasting system. Um, today is our fourth and final day of Stage 2 of the Children and Young People's Scotland Bill. And can I welcome Michael Russell, the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Lifelong Learning and his accompanying officials to the committee today. Officials are, of course, uh, not permitted to participate in the formal proceedings. I remind them, and although I'm sure they, they're well aware of that fact, um, can I just um, say to members, we have some additional members that are coming along this morning to move amendments or be involved in the discussion. Uh, Claire Adamson is absent today, but she's replaced by her substitute, Marco Biagio, who will be with us, I think, for... I know he's got, I think he's got an appointment, but he'll be with us for as long as he possibly can. So thank you, Marco, for coming along. And the Minister for Children and Young People will join us um, after we have debated the amendments on school closures. So with that, um, can I move now to the uh, day four of the uh, stage two of the Children and Young People Bill. And we start with amendment 380. Uh, as members know, the presiding officer has determined that this amendment is one to which rule 9.12.6b applies. However, no further amendments dealing with powers to charge fees have been lodged. As this is the last day of Stage 2 consideration, we are therefore able to dispose of Amendment 380 in its normal marshalled order. So therefore I call Amendment 380 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 370 on Day 3, and can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to move formally? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 380 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. The question is that Section 68 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Can I call Amendment 405 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with Amendments 406, 407, 408, 408A, 409, 409A and 423. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, to move Amendment 405 and speak to other amendments in the group. Thank you very much, Convener, and, and thank you for um, inviting me to the committee to do this. Um, I will, uh, unfortunately, have to speak for a reasonable length of time, given I'm covering all these amendments uh, here, but I hope you will bear with me uh, as I do so. Uh, amendment 405 sets a scene for the substantive package of amendments and school closures lodged in my name. It inserts a new part into the bill and makes clear that references to the 2010 Act in this part are to the Schools Consultation Scotland Act 2010. Now, I think we're all familiar with the issues that are raised here. School closures are an emotive and disruptive event, event for effective children, parents and communities. It's clear that the 2010 Act has not been operating in a way which is satisfactory for those affected or for education authorities. The Commission on the Delivery of Rural Education, jointly established by the Government and COSLA, was charged with examining the 2010 Act and its report made a number of recommendations for change, all of which, bar one, the Government has accepted. The amendments we discuss today will take forward many of the Commission's recommendations. Uh, some do not require legislation. The Commission's remit was to consider rural education, and Amendment 408 applies to rural schools only. However, the other amendments in my name apply to all schools and will approve and strengthen consultation in every community in Scotland. Amendment 407 requires an education authority to present information about the financial implications of a school closure proposal as part of its proposal paper for consultation. I think we're all determined that educational benefit must continue to be the primary consideration in making the case for school closure proposals. However, requiring authorities to provide clear financial information to communities will ensure a more informed debate about such a proposal. Amendment 408 makes a number of changes to the process for rural school closures under the 2010 Act. It seeks to clarify how an education authority should assess whether or not a rural school should close and will ensure that the 2010 Act operates as Parliament originally intended. When the Scottish Parliament passed the 2010 Act unanimously, it intended the three rural factors in Section 12 of the Act to operate as a presumption against closure of a rural school. They were expected to require local authorities to show that they had carefully considered and weighed up the implications of a closure. However, following the judicial review brought by Colin and and Shiar, it was clear that the provision in the Act did not have the required impact. Providing clarity on this issue was recommended by the Commission and strongly supported by the Government's consultation. That is what I now wish to deliver with Amendment 408. Amendment 408 sets out the detailed careful consideration that an education authority is required to carry out before even proposing a rural school closure. 
Authorities will be subject to an additional requirement to identify any reasonable alternatives to closure and to assess the likely educational benefits and effect on the rural community and on travel arrangements of any and each such alternative. These alternatives are to be set out in the consultation on the proposal and further alternatives may be proposed during the consultation. The authority is then to reassess the proposal and alternatives following consultation and if it chooses to proceed to explain why, in the light of these assessments, it still considers that the closure proposal is the most appropriate response. I want to ensure that future consultations reach not to just the letter, but the spirit of what the Parliament intended when it passed the 2010 Act. When I gave evidence to the committee in December, convener, I explained that we were still considering the best way to ensure that presumption against closure was as clear as possible. Having given this careful consideration, we think it is clearer and safer from a legal perspective to set out exactly what we expect authorities to have assessed and to have considered when formulating a closure proposal for a rural school and to set out exactly what they must assess and what they must explain when consulting on a closure proposal. We think that Amendment 408 will have the effect of ensuring that authorities will not be able to proceed with a closure proposal unless there is a clear educational benefit in doing so and unless there is more appropriate means to address whatever problem a rural school is experiencing. In other words, if this clear test is not met, a closure proposal cannot be implemented. And we consider that revising, added to and strengthening both the statutory assessment and the consultation requirements that authorities are subject to is a better way of achieving that policy. We consider it clearer that simply referring to a presumption against closure on the face of the 2010 Act, uh, which education authorities and the courts may in any case find not clear. These additional and strengthened statutory processes in new sections 12a and 13 should secure the careful and comprehensive consideration which has to be given by education authorities to any proposal to close a rural school given their particularly important status and given the long-term consequences of closure on both families and rural communities. I believe that is what these communities want and what they deserve. Amendment 409 makes a number of changes to the process for calling the determination. It requires Her Majesty's Inspector of Education to provide advice requested by the Scottish Ministers when they are deciding whether or not uh, a, to call in a closure proposal. Formalising this mechanism in legislation will add additional transparency to the process and ensures that Ministers have access to education advice in making their call-in decision. Following call-in of a school closure proposal by the Scottish Ministers, Amendment 409 requires Ministers to refer the proposal to a new public appointee and convener of the school's closure review panels and makes provision for the convener's appointment. It will be the responsibility of the convener to appoint individuals who will be eligible to be members of the panel and to constitute panels on a case-by-case -case basis to determine particular closure proposals once called in. Establishing the school closure review panels to determine school closure proposals will improve transparency and remove allegations of political bias from the decision-making process. While it has never been the case that ministers' decisions have been biased or influenced by political considerations, it is a perception that is often hard to refute. And in future, these decisions will be better taken away from the political spotlight and at arm's length from ministers. Just as ministers may obtain expert advice from Her Majesty's Inspector of Education at the call-in stage, Amendment 409 also provides for the panels to be able to draw on advice from HMIE, as well as information from the Education Authority and any other person. The judgment in the case of Colin and Neil and Shear versus the Scottish Ministers, held that the 2010 Act as drafted, required ministers to consider both the merits and the procedural aspects of an Education Authority's decision to implement a closure proposal. The Commission also recommended that ministers should consider the merits of this decision, as well as its procedural aspects. We have therefore accepted this recommendation. We have considered whether further clarification of the 2010 Act is required. However, given the judgment from the inner house of the Court of Session, it is clear that the wording used in Section 17.2 of the 2010 Act requires such a consideration. We have concluded that although not the original policy intention behind this provision, no amendment to Section 17.2 is required. We have also used the same formulation in new Section 17b and 17c to make it clear that the, a school closure review panel will also be required to consider the merits and procedural aspects of an education authority's decision in determining whether to consent or to refuse a proposal once called in. 
Had we chosen to amend the choice of wording used in the 2010 Act, this might have been interpreted as a meaning that the amended provision did not require a determination of both merits and process. We therefore concluded to follow the wording in the 2010 Act in relation to Colin. Amendment 409 also sets out the options a school closure review panel will have for determining a school closure proposal. The Commission recommended an additional option of remitting the proposal back to a local authority for the authority to take the decision afresh. And Amendment 409 adds this option to the decisions available to the school closure review panel. This respects the primacy of local decision-making in a case where a flaw in the closure proposal process, for example, can be easily remedied, and it's especially important given to the Amendment 406 lodged by Liz Smith, which I will speak about in more detail in a moment, would mean that refusing consent would lead to a five-year restriction on repeating the closure proposal. Finally, Amendment 409 provides for a right of appeal against a panel decision to the Sheriff Court on a point of law only. This achieves the right balance between providing a right of appeal and the need to ensure that decisions can be taken forward efficiently. I believe that the extensive changes to the call in the determination process contained in Amendment 409 will significantly improve the transparency of the overall process so it has the full confidence of communities and education authorities. I'm now turning with relief, convener, to the non-government amendments. I welcome Amendment 406, lodged by Elizabeth Smith, which I believe will significantly benefit communities that have been affected by a school closure proposal, giving them a degree of certainty over their school's future. I agree that a five-year period sets the correct balance between providing assurance to the community <coughs> and not unreasonably restricting an education authority's ability to manage its school estate. This Smith's amendment recognises that there will be exceptions to the moratorium during the five-year period, and I agree that it is necessary to have some limited flexibility in this area. Significant changes in the school's circumstances might include if a school's role declines dramatically or if the fabric of a building requires significant unplanned investment. The government will propose to set out in the revised statutory guidance for the 2010 Act further advice on the types of exception which might be appropriate. I'm glad there's support across the political divide for Amendment 406. This very much reflects the spirit in which the 2010 Act came into being and the unanimous support Parliament gave in passing it. I believe that Amendments 405 to 409 will benefit all of those who are involved in and affected by school closure. Amendment 408A proposed by Liz Smith would amend Amendment 408 to alter the basis on which an education authority could decide to implement a rural school closure proposal. Instead of the authority being satisfied, it would have to have demonstrated that this was the best option. I'm very sympathetic to this proposal. I understand and respect the intentions of this amendment. I accept that Liz Smith and others have concerns about whether satisfy is the most appropriate term to use. It may not be. But I don't believe changing the wording of Amendment 408 to include has demonstrated will actually deliver the clarity and improvements to the assessment and consultation process that both Liz Smith and I wish to see implemented. I have concerns that the change proposed by Amendment 488 would result in a lack of clarity. It's unclear to whom it would need to be demonstrated that closure would be the most appropriate response. And crucially, this could inject further uncertainty and delay for parents and young people. Further, given how controversial closure proposals can be, it's unclear that an education authority would ever be able to fully satisfy that test. So as currently drafted, Amendment 408 uh, also maintains consistency with the rest of the 2010 Act, which is desirable. I've already explained Amendment 408 will require an education authority to carry out a more rigorous assessment in its formulation of a rural school closure proposal and will require an authority to consult in a more thorough and transparent way. Complying with these requirements should mean that the authority will in practice demonstrate that its decisions is, the decision is the most appropriate response to the reasons for formulating the proposal. And if it does not, and the decision is considered to be unreasonable, ministers may call it in for the panel to determine. However, and I've indicated this many times during this process, I'm prepared to listen to suggestions to improve the provisions related to rural school pro closure proposals in advance of stage three. The additional safeguards for rural schools which were originally included in the 2010 Act actually followed a sustained campaign from communities supported by a number of MSPs and championed by Murdo Fraser. That's an example of MSPs from a number of different political parties working together to deliver this common objective, something I hope we can do again. 
So I'm very happy to discuss with Liz Smith and others who have an interest in this issue their concerns and the best way to deliver what we're all after, an improved assessment and consultation process. We need to step back and think of all of this through carefully uh, and the implications and consequences of any amendment, but we're clear as legislators that this is what we want, and if Liz Smith is prepared to undertake that process with those with whom she's involved, I'm prepared to undertake it to come back with an improved amendment uh, at stage three which can meet this objection. I now turn to amendment 409A lodged by Liam MacArthur, and he will be disappointed that I'm not going to be quite as positive in these circumstances. The Scottish ministers may only issue a call-in notice for a school closure proposal where it appears to them that the education authority may, and I use the word advisedly as in the legislation, may have failed to comply with the factors set out in 17.2a and b in a significant regard to comply with the requirements imposed on it by or under the Act so far as they are relevant in relation to the closure proposal or to take proper account of a material consideration relevant to its decision to implement the proposal. The crucial word in the 2010 Act is may. At this stage in the process, ministers have not decided that a failure has occurred. Issues might have been raised in representations made to ministers or in reviewing the documentation associated with the proposal, which suggested that the Education Authority may have failed to comply with the 2010 Act, and therefore ministers should call in the proposal. However, in undertaking further investigation and evidence gathering following Colin, a school closure review panel could find that the authority has not failed in either of these respects and that the appropriate decision is to grant consent. That does not mean that the proposal should not have been called in. It is important that possible failures are investigated. Undertaking this further investigation, making determinations as the proposals called in, in a manner which has the confidence of the affected community and the education authority, is the primary role of the school closure review panel. Amendment 409 already requires the panel to give reasons for its decision, which may, in practice, make it clear whether the panel considers that a call-in was required or not. Further, the amendment requires the convener of the school closure review panels to provide an annual report to the Scottish Parliament on its decisions. Therefore, it will be apparent if there are many school closure proposals or any school closure proposals called in but given unconditional consent by the panels. As such, though I will, of course, listen to any arguments Liam MacArthur puts forward cogently, I don't think that this amendment is necessary. And indeed, it may deflect the panel in spending time on looking backwards instead of considering the matters in front of it. Therefore, with some relief, I ask you to support the committee to support amendments 405, 407, 408, 409 and 423 in my name, and amendment 406 in the name of Liz Smith, I do not support amendments 408A and 409A, though I am willing to work with Liz Smith uh, to see if we can find a way forward for her amendment to improve the legislation. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I have been uh, extremely generous with time, but given we're inserting a, a, completely new section, a completely new part into the bill, I felt that it was appropriate that members got a full understanding of what these amendments uh, referred to. Uh, I'll be equally generous, if no, not quite as lengthy, hopefully, uh, with other members who have to move amendments uh, in this part of the bill. Uh, Liz Smith, can I call Liz Smith to speak to Amendment 406 and other amendments in the group? Uh, thank you, Convener. I'm afraid it is a little lengthy, but hopefully maybe not quite as lengthy as the Cabinet Secretary. Um, in the event of a, a school closure proposal being rejected, Amendment 406 would ensure that the de decision about that will not be revisited for a period of five years. I listened uh, very carefully to the debate about the appropriate length of time for a moratorium to follow the rejection of a school closure. And I'm very grateful to Councillor Douglas Chapman and his COSLA colleagues for the letter that they wrote to the committee on the 17th of January, specifically paragraph 7, in which Councillor Chapman sets out his reasons for the rejection of this uh, amendment. Now, I have considered his points uh, very carefully, uh, most especially his concern about the Scottish Government's decision not to implement uh, Recommendation 20. But I've also considered the issue about how to balance educational uh, benefit, which I think the Cabinet Secretary referred to uh, quite rightly as the prime uh, motive, with the challenges facing local authorities as they seek to rationalise their education services. This is not an easy issue, but I have come down on the side of favouring a five-year moratorium with some flexibility, so let me explain why. No one would prevent uh, this multiple review from occurring over a short period of time, but it would give parents, pupils and teachers the necessary confidence to commit to the school and develop it beyond just the short term. 
Whilst a rare occurrence, there have been instances of schools going through three or four closure proposals in under a decade. Such uncertainty benefits no one and can obviously create a vicious circle whereby parents uh, opt against sending their child to the school, uh, which in turn calls into question its long-term viability. A five-year moratorium would ensure that communities are not put through what Leslie Manson of the Association of Directors of Education described as a constant merry-go-round. Indeed, it might well encourage parents to send their children to rural schools, safe in the knowledge that the school has a medium-term future and the opportunity to address any shortcomings. A further upshot of the five-year period concerns the fact that any second proposal would fall after council elections and as such would be considered uh, by some fresh faces. This would ensure that the arguments are deliberately anew and that different vo voices partake in the process. Convener, while I think there are arguments for a three- or a seven-year moratorium, providing uh, the balance, I think, that is required that we are seeking uh, between safeguarding the school's immediate future and monitoring its progress, I have come down uh, on the uh, five-year moratorium. So I move amendment in... Uh, no, I won't move it yet. I will speak to 406. On the question of uh, 408A, uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary, uh, for uh, your comments in this. Uh, when uh, this committee, uh, or a predecessor committee, met on the 30th of September uh, 2009, the then Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop said that the intention of the bill was to create a robust, fair and transparent process that addresses all concerns. And that obviously was very much the uh, spirit of the bill at the time. Section 5 of the bill, which is now the Act, was supposed to be absolutely watertight when it came to ensuring that the decision-making process was based on accurate and relevant information and that there was absolutely no scope for misinterpretation. That has turned, not to be, turned out not to be the case, which is largely why we are here amending this legislation. And in the interim period, we've been furnished with very detailed evidence prevented by several key witnesses who have been able to demonstrate just how extensive has been the misuse or, in a few cases, the failure to present accurate information within decision-making. That evidence included examples of situations where information had been incomplete, of other situations where it had been inaccurate, and perhaps worst of all, situations where it had been alleged that information had been withheld or misrepresented so as to suit a specific viewpoint. This committee has been presented with very detailed evidence in this area, and I won't go over it all again, but suffice to say that wherever, whatever the reason for misinformation happens to be, it is completely unacceptable, and it is important that within this bill we ensure that there is scope for this, no scope for this practice in the future. Amendment 408A is an attempt to ensure that any local authority has to demonstrate how it has arrived at its decision rather than just be called upon to claim that it is satisfied that it has met the correct criteria. One stakeholder simply saying that it is satisfied is absolutely no guarantee uh, that it is and that any appropriate and objectively uh, drawn conclusions have been made. It is my understanding that Cabinet Secretary is very much sympathetic uh, to the uh, spirit of this amendment, but I do understand what he's saying, that in terms of demonstrating, we have to be more specific. So can I take him up on his offer uh, of meeting before Stage 3 so that we can bring forward an amendment uh, that is tighter on this basis? Because I think the last thing we want to do is to create any further uh, conclusions. So I may thank the Cabinet Secretary uh, for that. Uh, on the, the other uh, amendments uh, in the Cabinet Secretary's uh, name and one in uh, Liam MacArthur's name, uh, I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for saying that the Scottish Conservatives have a very long-standing interest in this issue because of the uh, uh, efforts by my colleague Murdo Fraser in 2007 for bringing forward his own bill proposals, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for uh, referring to that. I think you, the Cabinet Secretary is absolutely correct when he says that the essential principles which ought to underpin all school closures, irrespective of whether they are rural or urban, must revolve around the maximum educational, economic and social benefit which can be achieved. And the provision of a completely level playing field, full of transparency when it comes to the actual decision-making process and the opportunity for engagement with and participation by the interested parties. I believe these principles have actually been at the basis of deliberations of this issue right back uh, before 2010, but for one reason or another, mainly in terms of the interpretation of language in the bill, many of the recent decisions regarding the closure of proposals about schools have not been able to adhere to these principles. I think the six areas of concern that were set out by the Commission are absolutely correct, and I think it's appropriate that we are looking uh, at each of these in terms of these uh, rural amendments. Convener, we had a very interesting debate uh, at committee about the concept of presumption, what it really means and whether it needs to be set in stone or in face of the bill. 
It was pointed out by some witnesses that it was fully written, if it was fully written into the bill, it would raise too many expectations amongst parents and that all schools would stay open when, in fact, that would not be the correct decision. It would, in one witness's words, set the bar too high. Whilst I could understand the logic behind this statement, I was persuaded of other evidence that in too many cases the intended presumption against closure was in some circumstances going to be interpreted by local authorities as a presumption to close. And I note what the Cabinet Secretary said in the point uh, in response to a question from uh, Joan McAlpine at Committee on the 3rd of December 2013. The ruling by the Court of Session has said very clearly that relying on matters to have regard to is not sufficiently tight and therefore it had allowed misunderstanding and evasion. So anything we can do to tighten up that, I think, uh, is uh, absolutely crucial. Uh, convener, I will be uh, supporting the uh, government's uh, amendments uh, in this area. On the question of Mr MacArthur's one, while I understand the spirit uh, that Mr MacArthur is presenting on this, uh, I do accept what the Cabinet Secretary is saying about the, uh, the wording of this. Uh, so I'm interested to hear what Mr MacArthur has to say in his response. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Can I call Lee MacArthur to speak to Amendment 409A and other amendments in the group? Thank you. Uh, convener, like the Cabinet Secretary Liz Smith, can I apologise at the start for the, the length of my uh, comments here, although I hope you are reassured that we will witness an increasing level of brevity um, in accordance with uh, Liz Smith's comments. Uh, convener, as ever, I need to declare an interest uh, in this issue as the father of a son at a primary school identified for closure uh, prior to the last local council elections. From that experience, I am all too well aware of the impact that even the prospect uh, of closure of a school can have on pupils, on staff, parents, uh, and indeed the wider rural community. Fortunately, two of the proposed school closures in Orkney appear to have been shelved, but it's fair to say that people in Stennis and Bury uh, remain apprehensive. Uh, the threat did bring both communities closer together. Um, the experience was difficult for all involved, uh, and I accept it was difficult also for uh, those in the Council taking forward the proposals. Um, all of that is perhaps predictable, but what I had not expected uh, was the effect that it had on some of the pupils involved. Listening to my youngest son, it was clear that he, along with some, uh, perhaps all of his peers, felt somehow responsible for what was happening. Uh, this despite the reassurances and the support given by us as parents, uh, by by, uh, the teachers, by support staff uh, and others. I confess that I find this almost the most difficult aspect of the whole experience to deal with. So I do not underestimate the importance of the amendments in this part of the bill, including uh, Liz Smith's Amendment 406, seeking to limit the speed with which any closure proposal affecting a particular school could be initiated, uh, save for in uh, exceptional circumstances as articulated by uh, Mr Russell. However, we only passed the previous Act back in 2010, and if that experience tells us anything, it is that we should take great care not to raise expectations unduly about what we're trying to do or what this legislation will be able to do. Moreover, I'm in absolutely no doubt at all that the responsibility for these decisions should continue to rest with local authorities, not ministers or panels of experts, however esteemed or independent. We can undoubtedly assist them in that task, help ensure that decisions are taken on the best uh, possible evidence and only subject to very tightly defined and clearly understood criteria. But ultimately, government, at whatever level, is about making choices, taking decisions, even uh, or indeed particularly <coughs> where they are difficult. Pretending otherwise may offer short-term respite, but the longer-term consequences can invariably prove more serious and damaging. Turning to the amendments in this grouping, I'm broadly supportive of the changes uh, being put forward, which, as the Cabinet Secretary indicated, do largely reflect the conclusions of the Sullivan Commission. Uh, that said, I recognise the dis disappointment felt by some Commission members uh, and, indeed, uh, many in local government about the uh, Scottish Government's refusal to accept Recommendation 20. It does seem to me that this is likely to be an area around which most controversy uh, will continue to be focused and where decisions uh, may be challenged in the future, but it wasn't clear to me, as I think was the case with Liz Smith and the Minister, uh, that adopting Recommendation 20 and diluting the threshold uh, that had to be met in terms of educational benefit would have avoided this happening uh, in any event. I welcome efforts being made to support local councils uh, in the earlier stages as well as to improve the basis on which proposals come forward initially and are then consulted upon. I certainly hope that amendments 407 and 408 do reduce the number of cases that subsequently uh, are challenged, although it's not entirely clear how Education Scotland will be able to manage the potential conflicts of interest in its different roles, uh, as was uh, uh, indicated through evidence uh, earlier in this process. Uh, the Chinese walls needed here may well be visible from space. 
Uh, and Mr Russell's Amendment 409 uh, proposes changes to call-in procedures and introduces the idea of a review panel. He will recall, um, as he did in, in his earlier remarks, uh, our exchanges uh, during uh, Stage 1 evidence, uh, that I have concerns about Ministers retaining the power to call in Council decisions, but leaving examination and determination to an independent panel of experts. I accept, um, and this has been confirmed by Mr Russell's comments, that I am not going to persuade uh, the Minister to change his mind on this, but uh, he will appreciate my concern that this leaves Ministers free to uh, play to the gallery in calling in controversial decisions, but without having to worry about actually determining whether or not that decision was justified. In order to address this, my amendment 409A seeks to introduce an option for the panel also to pass judgment on the validity of the call-in by the Minister. Obviously, this option would only be exercised where the panel felt the Council was justified in its original decision to close, but I think it, or at least a variant of it, could act as a useful check on Ministers simply calling in decisions because it was politically expedient to do so uh, and even the perception of that, as the Minister himself acknowledged, uh, is, is damaging uh, and has given rise uh, in the past to accusations of political bias. Finally, like, while, uh, like uh, the Cabinet Secretary, I understand the motivation behind Liz Smith's Amendment 408A. I do have concerns about the practicalities of the provision. At the end of the day, it may be impossible to demonstrate to the satisfaction of those opposed to a proposed closure the benefits to be had, in which case such wording is only likely uh, to raise expectations unfairly or prolong uh, conflict, or indeed uh, both, something I know that we are all very keen uh, to avoid. In conclusion, uh, I acknowledge the importance of the improvements we are seeking to introduce uh, in this part of the bill. I am disappointed the Minister's failure to accept uh, my own amendment in this grouping, although at this stage it hardly comes as a surprise. Um, I do accept that through the amendment uh, 409 improvements are being uh, introduced uh, into the bill, but without uh, some safeguard of the kind that I'm seeking to introduce through my own amendment, uh, I, uh, I, I do have reservations about how this will uh, be implemented. Uh, so I may reserve the right to bring uh, this amendment or a variant of it back at, uh, at stage three, but I, uh, I, I welcome the comments that uh, the Minister has made in terms of clarifying his position on it. Thank you, Convener. Uh, thank you very much. Um, We'll have a number of members who wish to contribute to this debate, so can I begin by calling uh, Neil Bibby. Thanks, Convener. Um, I'd just like to start my comments uh, in relation to Amendment 408. Um, I have a number of concerns about uh, this amendment, um, and I also note the concerns of uh, COSLA about the exclusion of uh, recommend. 20 from the report published by the COSLA and Scottish Government Commission recommendation 20 that said it should be acceptable for an educational benefit statement and conclude that the education impact is neutral with no overall educational detriment to the children directly concerned. Um, COSLA, uh, or Councillor Douglas Chapman from COSLA has since uh, written to uh, the committee uh, stating that by not implementing recommendation 20 the government has altered the balance brought in by the Commission and we are now concerned it will actually be far harder for local authorities to take necessary decisions uh, on the school estate. He goes on to state um, that he has uh, written to the Cabinet Secretary uh, to express concern that, that the impact that the amended legislation could have on improving educational uh, outcomes and also raising uh, the concerns of members of COSLA that the proposals to amend the 2010 Act um, do not have uh, embraced all that the Commission was trying to achieve, and because of this, local government's job uh, will be made uh, all the harder. So those are uh, very serious concerns, which I think we need to um, take uh, note of when, when discussing uh, these amendments. And I think um, they, they raise very uh, valuable concerns about the um, Amendment uh, 408. In addition to that, there are also um, some concerns I have about uh, the steps and the unnecessary burden um, it could place on local authorities, particularly um, on, on st uh, steps taken um, before uh, school closure proposals. For example, a school that has zero pupils in a population that suggests there will be uh, no increase in that population, there is little point at looking at alternatives, for example. I do not think uh, we want to see the mothballing um, of schools uh, where there are uh, no children. There is also the obvious question that has been raised um, about uh, the community benefits and the transport um, op opportunities 
um, that, uh, an obvious question about why that shouldn't be applied to all schools and not just uh, rural schools. In terms of Amendment 409, um, I have another, a number of concerns about this proposal. Uh, one is, uh, as Liam MacArthur mentioned, the abdication of ministerial and government responsibility. The panel will be appointed by ministers, yet will have a fair uh, degree of autonomy. There is little here regarding the criteria against wh when, uh, which the convener will be appointed and who, uh, the convener who will select um, the panel uh, members. There appears to be an attempt uh, to divert responsibility for making unpopular decisions um, to the panel, and it's unclear um, who the panel will be um, accountable uh, to. There is also, um, is, um, as, as someone has put it, uh, this would represent another quango um, from um, a government that uh, said it would cut the number of quangos and is likely to increase expenditure uh, with the Scottish Government saying the panel will have uh, whatever staff and resources is needed. It would therefore be helpful to know if the Scottish Government have any sort of cost limit in relation to the setting up of, of this panel. Uh, and as such, um, I cannot support Amendment 409. 409A, in the name of Lee MacArthur, would ensure that if a minister called in a closure proposal, uh, but the panel found in favour of an authority that they would have to make uh, that in their response that the proposal should not have been called in. I would uh, very much agree uh, with that amendment. In terms of Amendment 406, in the name of Liv Smith, uh, would make local authorities unable to make any new proposals for a period of five years. I believe this has the potential uh, to be too restrictive. I would uh, believe this should be reduced um, from five years uh, to three years. Five years is likely to be out with the period of an administration, given that they are unlikely to consult and get a decision on any new proposals on day one of an administration's period in office. In terms of Amendment 407, in the name of uh, Mike Russell, financial impact uh, of closures, this would appear to allow the Scottish Government to show that some proposals uh, by councils are being used to save money. However, on the flip side, local authorities could also show that money is being better spent. So I would be comfortable with Amendment 307, uh, 407 on that basis. And finally, Amendment 408, uh, A in the name of Lisbeth, places, I believe, an additional burden of demonstration on local authorities. I don't believe this would be necessary because if the authority has, made, uh, has met the preliminary requirements, then surely, in effect, it would have demonstrated that closure is the most uh, appropriate course of action. Uh, so I'm not convinced by that uh, proposal. Um, so in conclusion, um, uh, convener, um, I at present will be abstaining on Amendment 408, opposing Amendment 409 um, and opposing Amendment 406 and 408A. Thank you very much. Can I call Colin Beattie? Thank you, Having been or having experienced the closure of no less than six rural schools in, uh, in Midlothian, um, I've always got a big interest in this section. Um, I welcome the amendments the Cabinet Secretary has brought forward, which I think uh, just extend and the consistency which the government uh, acted on to improve transparency and public confidence in the school closures process. Uh, I noticed that uh, the Cabinet Secretary actually back in June confirmed that educational benefit would remain a key consideration of the school closure decision-making process. And, you know, I think that's an important point to, to keep. So I very much welcome, as I say, the amendments that have been brought forward. Turning to the amendment uh, 406 uh, from Liz Smith, um, I must say, when I saw the five years at first, I thought that's quite a long time. And uh, Neil Baby made uh, one or two well, uh, relevant comments in regard to that. However, on consideration and thinking about the uh, responses which overwhelmingly support the, from the consultation overwhelmingly support the uh, the five year moratorium uh, I was persuaded perhaps that this is a, this is a amendment's the right thing to support on 408 a um, i don 't think this is actually a change that's uh, that 's necessary um, it 's the responsibility of the education authority to be satisfied as to its compliance and any implementation of the proposal 
uh, as the most appropriate response to the reasons for the formulation of the proposal, it really should stick with the, uh, with the uh, education authority. And uh, I think there'll be a lot of opposition, actually, from local authorities on this one. 409A, um, well, 409 already requires a panel to give reasons for its decision, and uh, that presumably will make clear whether the panel thought the call-in was required or not. Uh, there's also an annual report that will be sent to Parliament about the decisions that have been taken that year, and that's from the convener of the school closure review panel. So any information about the number of school closure proposals which have been called in and where consent has been granted, they'll be all readily available. So I don't really see the purpose of uh, Amendment 409A. Uh, thank you very much. Can I call uh, Mike McKenzie? Thank you, Convener. I'm grateful for the opportunity of uh, speaking in favour of Amendment 408, and I felt it's important to do so because school closures are an issue that cause real difficulty across the Highlands and Islands. I should also say at this point that I'm sympathetic of the spirit of what Liz Smith is attempting to achieve uh, with her Amendment 408A. It causes difficulty, um, this issue, for councils, for council members, for parents, for children and for communities. And as we've seen, it also causes difficulty for courts. For the sake of all concerned, it's important, I think, that the Parliament take this opportunity for clarification. The spirit and the intent of the 2010 Act seem very clear. In practice, however, it seems it has not been clearly understood. We need to take the opportunity of making it clearer for the sake of all those mentioned above. Convener, it was a disappointment to me that Argyll and Duke Council, in giving evidence to the committee, did not enter into the spirit of candour which characterises the interaction of most agencies and most individuals with this Parliament. The committee and the Parliament should have the benefit of learning from the experience of the proposed Argyll and Butte school closures in 2010. The experience of the parents and the communities affected by these proposals differs greatly from the version that has been presented by Argyll and Butte Council. For example, the community on the island of Ling very quickly showed that closure of their school would result in pupils having a very much longer journey than the guidelines suggested. This journey to the next nearest school also involved a ferry journey, which is often subject to cancellation or delay because of bad weather. Their school was taken off the list, which was then reduced to 25 very quickly. But similar inaccuracies were seen in proposals for a high number of the other schools. Parents were aghast to discover that the council that they trusted with the education of their children could be so casual about these closure pr proposals. They were shocked, too, to discover so many mistakes. Instead of admitting their mistakes, the council clung tenaciously to the proposals and inevitably and understandably, trust then began to break down. Thanks to the good offices of the Rural Schools Network and the expertise of Sandy Longmuir, whom the committee have heard from, and to the parents' own diligence in scrutinising proposals and acquiring their own expertise, the proposals were revealed as increasingly incompetent. Councillors, too, local members, were disappointed that the information they had accepted from officers proved to be so untrustworthy. The final straw came when Sandy Longmuir was able to conclusively prove that far from saving the Council money, many of these proposals would cost them money. Convener, the statistics show that our small rural schools substantially outperform the average school. They are the jewels in the crown of our education system, and if they can be saved, they should be. They're, they're at the very foundations of sustainable rural communities, as parents quite rightly place such a high value on the quality of education. Argyll and Butte Council is one of the very few areas in Scotland with a declining population. People are voting with their feet and rejecting the dead hand of Argyll and Butte Council. Parliament must take into account the worst of councils as well as the best of them and therefore urge the committee to support this amendment and those others brought forward by the Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, thank you very much. Um, be, before I uh, call the Minister, I have one or two comments uh, myself on these amendments. Can I um, support the amendments in the name of the Cabinet Secretary? I think, um, given what has occurred um, since the 2010 Act came into being, it was clear that um, a relatively quick resolution to these issues was required, and I, so they're very much welcome the changes that are being brought forward through these amendments uh, in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Um, turning to the, name, the amendments in, in the name of uh, opposition members, uh, I also was interested in the uh, amendment in the name of Liz Smith 406 and the length of time chosen uh, at five years. Uh, not because I thought it was too long, because I, but I wondered whether or not seven years was a more appropriate period, because that has the length of an individ, individual pupil's schooling at primary school, and therefore I uh, wondered whether or not that would be a more appropriate uh, time. However, I do accept that five years strikes at the right balance, probably, um, in, the, in the circumstances that Liz Smith outlined. I don't believe it's, it's too short a period. I think if we had a period of three years, then effectively what we would have is almost, in some cases, a perpetual round um, of uh, closure proposals, and we would never escape from that particular cycle. Uh, and effectively, the, the, the proposals, as outlined, um, uh, by Liz Smith would occur that uh, effectively people would, parents would vote with their feet uh, and we would have a circ circumstance where schools would be closed by default rather than by intent and I think that therefore uh, shows that three years would be too short a period. I certainly welcome the discussion that has been agreed between the Cabinet Secretary and Liz Smith on Amendment 408A. Uh, we have to have absolute clarity in this area. We don't want to be back here in a short period of time going over this again. So I welcome that discussion. And finally, on Amendment 409A, I certainly cannot support uh, the amendment in the name of Liam MacArthur, uh, not because it's the name of Liam MacArthur, as he's beginning to uh, suspect uh, in, forward, in terms of his amendments, but because I do not believe that uh, any uh, Cabinet Secretary or Minister can call in um, a, such a, deci a decision uh, on a whim. Uh, that is not the basis on which these things are done. Uh, there is a process which is, uh, has to be undergone. Uh, it can be very difficult to persuade a Minister to call in um, effectively one of these decisions by a council, uh, having gone through some of them myself, I think it's important that there is a, a right balance and a separation of powers in this area, and I don't think uh, the Amendment 409A actually uh, strikes at what is the reality of the situation in, in terms of the decision that a, a minister, uh, whether it be this particular Cabinet Secretary or any future Cabinet Secretary, would make. There is a process to be undertaken, and ministers, I'm sure, do, do that diligently and with due regard to the process and the rules in place. Uh, therefore, I cannot support uh, Amendment 409A. Uh, with that, can I call on the Cabinet Secretary to wind up? Thank you, Convener, and thank you for the discussion that has taken place. Um, I do understand the point, if I may start with Mr MacArthur's um, uh, a, a amendment. I do understand the point he is making and the fact that ministers might be more reluctant to call in proposals if uh, they felt that they were going to be publicly criticised for so doing. But I have to, when you look at the actual list of proposals that have been called in, and the suggestion, thank you, and the suggestion that there should be, um, that the suggestion that there should be um, a, a, an even smaller list in future, given uh, the involvement of Education Scotland and the intention to do so, then I, I think even on that grounds this is unnecessary. But Mr MacArthur should be reassured that in actual fact a panel could undertake the actions we're talking about without any specific legislation. And given there's to be an annual report, I would expect the, an independent convener uh, to, to want to say if he felt ministers were abusing the legislation in any way. So I think the intention that Mr MacArthur has is, is probably a good intention. I just think adding this to the bill is unnecessary and might uh, if it is enshrined in legislation this way, encourage local authorities to focus solely on this when it comes to a consideration by the panel, uh, trying to get a justification uh, from the panel that there shouldn't have been a call-in. So I, I think we have a better situation within the bill, and therefore, reluctantly, I'm not supporting it. And I, I can't, I, of course, absolutely. Yeah, I'm grateful for um, the, 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 the Cabinet Secretary uh, I think accepting at least the principle behind um, what I'm seeking to achieve with this amendment, but would you not accept that what he has, um, he has just um, implied might be the response of local authorities it is no different from me suggesting um, uh, that even the perception that the minister may take an approach to, to, to calling in uh, particular proposals 
is something that we may need to guard against. It is something that, be, that, that would be better dealt with on the face of the bill rather than simply assuming it will happen as a matter of course. No, I, I disagree. I think it would be best dealt with if we have robust legislation that is entirely clear and we are trying to improve the legislation by this process. Uh, once we have that legislation, I think it is also well dealt with if all those involved uh, forbear from attacking ministers when they're making these decisions on the grounds of being political partisan, but in actual fact look at the facts of the case. So I think those two things together would probably assist. The number of schools, and I have it here in front of me, uh, that have been called in, of those, uh, if the final outcome was unconditional consent, six schools, 7% of the total. So it is possible in 7% of those cases that that might be the judgment of the panel. But in actual fact, because the issue is may, then I think a very, very small number of those would be subject to comment and the panel would be free to comment. It's interesting to know that 24% of the total of all those schools pre prepared for uh, uh, closure, 24% got conditional consent. So that meant there were issues that were clarified and assisted by this process. And I think that that is vital. And only 10% were refused consent. Um, let me deal with Mr. McKenzie, if I might, just very briefly. I, I do understand the points that he is making. I did live through the experience of the school's closures uh, in, the, in Argyll and Butte, not once but twice, because I was involved in an earlier round of school closures, and I declare an interest there in which my wife was the head teacher of a school that was closed. This is a very da damaging process for everybody involved, and I thought Mr. MacArthur was quite right to say pupils and staff often blame themselves for the process that they're going through. Uh, we must have a fair, transparent, it's a point that Liz Smith has made on the occasion, fair and transparent process. That is not assisted if the information within the process is uh, regarded as being unfair, and not comprehensive, and often almost impossible to understand. And I do regret that the information this committee was given was, in the opinion of many people in Argyll and Butte, um, well, let me put it this way, it did not conform to the facts of the chronology or the process. And I think that was regrettable, and the Council might still want to consider that matter. Uh, if I might deal with the points that Mr Bibby has made, um, if the school has no pupils, then a local authority would have to consider alternatives only where there are alternatives. I have never argued that all schools should remain open. There are schools that close because they have no pupils. They close themselves. And I think it is a red herring to raise that issue. Uh, I do think that Mr Bibby's position, however, is logically inconsistent, having attacked me for uh, refusing to accept one out of 37 recommendations, and it was the only one that was not unanimous by the Commission. Mr Bibby then announced at the end of his, uh, his intervention that he was going to reject more than that in terms of his approach to my amendments. So Mr Bibby is taking a position that is less consistent than that even taken by Cosler. Um, I do think his position was more motivated by the Bain principle than anything else, that is, oppose anything that the SNP says. Of course. Of course, it wasn't um, uh, just me that has uh, raised concerns about the altering of the balance of the, uh, of the legislation. Uh, Councillor Douglas Chapman has done that uh, on behalf of COSLA as well. I heard Mr. Uh, Mr. Bibby the first time on that matter. My point uh, remains. I disagree with COSLA on this. I've done it uh, openly and, and I've had this discussion with them. I've done so because I believe that educational benefit is paramount, as we should all believe that educational benefit is paramount in all educational decisions. Um, and we've had that disagreement. It is one out of 37, and it is the only amendment that, was, uh, that had a minority report. Mr. Bibby's position, and I repeat this, will be to oppose more than that of the recommendations. So if I am altering the balance of proposals, Mr. Bibby is undermining them uh, in an even greater way. Uh, and I think that, that, that speaks volumes for the fact that this is motivated by the Bain principle rather than anything else at all. Um, can I simply say on the amendments that I'm proposing... I do think these are valuable contributions, not because I'm proposing them, but because the Commission on Rural Education brought these forward as very strong views as to what should change. Uh, and in all those circumstances, I think that they are there for amendments that will be welcomed right across Scotland. There are differences of opinion. Uh, COSLA does object to the idea of a five-year moratorium. If I hear of one thing that those involved in this process say again and again, having saved a school, it is please don't let them come again for us too quickly. They recognise, people recognise that times change, but they really don't want to go through this again and again and again. And I think the five-year proposal is a sensible one. 
Um, if I can make the point about the Smith's Amendment 408A, I do repeat the undertaking. I will work with the Smith uh, and with others to make sure that we get this absolutely correct. And I would hope at stage three we could find a way in which the Smith would bring an amendment that would achieve the effect that she wishes and others wish. Finally, convener. I do think that the changes to call-in and the determination process in Amendment 409 are very important indeed. I do think that to take ministers out of the final decision is the right thing to do. I heard Mr Bibby lambasting me for uh, 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 giving up that right. Mr Bibby and his colleagues usually lambast me for exercising the rights I have as a minister. There really is no winning in these matters, but I do think it is absolutely the right thing to make sure that there is another set of voices in this so that we can it returned to the intention of the Act, and the intention was to have a level playing field. It was to have transparency. It was to make sure that uh, people are treated fairly. And in all those circumstances, I think we are getting a, a further step towards that, difficult as it has been. And I would encourage members not to sit on the sidelines, not to undermine the Rural Schools Commission, as, as Mr Bibby proposes to do, but to support these amendments and to make sure we take the issue forward. Uh, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the question, therefore, is that Amendment 405 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 406 in the name of Liz Smith? Already debated with Amendment 405. Liz Smith to move or not move? <coughs> uh, the question is that Amendment 406 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not all agreed, therefore there will be a division. Would those members who wish to support Amendment 406 please show? Those against? Thank you. The result of the vote on Amendment 406, there were seven votes in favour and two votes against. Therefore, uh, uh, Amendment 406 is agreed to. Can I call Amendment 407, the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 405. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 407 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Can I call Amendment 408 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary? Already debated with Amendment 405. Cabinet Secret Secretary to move formally. Move. Can I call Amendment 408A in the name of Liz Smith? Already debated with Amendment 405. Liz Smith to move or not move? Uh, not moved, Convener. It's on the basis of the strict understanding that the Cabinet Secretary will engage uh, prior to Stage 3 and that we are able to put in motion an amendment uh, which stops any of the incidences to which Mr Mackenzie referred. Uh, and there have been, obviously, various other councils where information uh, has been uh, misinterpreted. Thank you. So that's not moved. The question is that Amendment 408A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? So that's not been moved. Apologies. The question is that Amendment 408 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. They are not all agreed, therefore there will be a division. Uh, would those who wish to support Amendment 408 please show? Thank you. Those opposed? <coughs> Abstentions? The result of the division on Amendment 408, uh, there were seven votes in favour and two abstentions, uh, no votes against. The amendment is therefore agreed to. Can I call Amendment 409 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary? Already debated with Amendment 405. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Move. Can I call Amendment 409A in the name of Liam MacArthur? Already debated with Amendment 405. Liam MacArthur to move or not move? With less hope and expectation than Liz Smith. I will draw at the moment, not move it, um, but re return to the stage three, so not move. For Thank you. Not moved. Uh, the question is, therefore, that Amendment 409 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're not all agreed. Uh, therefore, there will be a revision. Uh, would those members who wish to support Amendment 409 please show? Thank you. Uh, those against? Result of the vote on Amendment 409, there were seven votes in favour, two votes against. The amendment is therefore agreed to. Um, I will call a short suspension at this point to allow a change of minister.
Can I welcome the Minister to this morning's uh, committee meeting and can I call Amendment 410 in the name of the Minister, grouped with other amendments as shown in the groupings. Uh, uh, Minister, to move Amendment 400, 410 and speak to other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Uh, I move Amendment 410 in my name. The Children's Hearing uh, Scotland Act 2011 places an obligation on safeguarders appointed under the Act to produce a report for a children's hearing. In certain circumstances, it is extremely difficult for a safeguarder to carry out their investigations and produce a detailed report for the hearing because of the time limits for certain hearings proceedings. The standard time for producing a safeguarder report is 35 days. However, some hearings take place after as few as two working days. Amendment 410 removes the duty on safeguarders to produce reports in these limited circumstances, as no meaningful report can be produced. Amendment 411 is a technical amendment to ensure that where a child protection order is made under the 2011 Act, the period within which the eighth working day hearing is to take place begins on the eighth working day after the making of or implementation of the order, as was the case under the Children's Scotland Act 1995. Amendment 412 gives power to a pre-hearing panel to determine whether a person who had previously been deemed to be a relevant person in relation to a child should not continue to be deemed a relevant person. The pre-hearing panel would have power to make such a determination if the person does not have and has not recently had a significant involvement in the upbringing of the child. A pre-hearing panel has a power to deem a person to be a relevant person in relation to a child, so we consider that it's appropriate that a pre-hearing panel should also have the power to undeem a relevant person. Part of Amendment 432 provides that a person undeemed by a pre-hearing panel may appeal against that decision. And Part of Amendment 426, which is part of a later group, ensures that children's legal aid is available for such an appeal. Amendment 414 addresses the situation where a child does not attend a grounds hearing for unforeseen reasons, but where the child's circumstances uh, are such that it is necessary as a matter of urgency for that hearing to, be, to put in place measures to protect the child. This amendment would give the grounds hearing power to make an interim compulsory supervision order, an ICSO, where the hearing considers that the nature of the child's circumstances is such that for the protection, treatment, guidance or control of the child, this is unnecessary as a matter of urgency. This would allow the hearing to be assured that appropriate supervision is in place to protect the child for an interim period until subsequent grounds hearing can be held. Amendment 413 is a technical clarifying amendment to ensure that a children's hearing is able to address all of the issues that may merit compulsory supervision. Situations can arise where the child or relevant person indicates to the hearing that grounds are accepted but certain facts, perhaps significant facts, are not. The hearing should not be impeded by limited acceptance of certain facts, especially where they consider it appropriate that they should be able to have any disputed matters sent to the sheriff for determination. The policy intention is that children's hearings should be able to address all the issues in a child's life that may merit compulsory supervision. The amendment obliges the chair of the hearing to check understanding and acceptance of each fact and on that basis enables the hearing to decide whether to proceed on that basis of the accepted facts alone or to send the matter to the sheriff for determination. Amendment 415 simplifies the basis on which the timeframes can be calculated for in in interim compulsory supervision orders being sought by the principal reporter from the sheriff. The previous provision made it difficult for the reporter to align the expiry of ICSOs with a timely and appropriate application to the sheriff. In order to comply with the statutory timescales, children and families were being called into uh, ICSO review hearings to renew uh, an interim order for a matter of days before returning to the sheriff for the same case. That process was not child-centred. This amendment enables the reporter to make an application at a suitable point before the expiry of the third ICSO. This amendment keeps ICSO decisions in the hands of the tribunal, limits the number of successive ICSOs applying to the child, simplifies hearings administration and still prevents the sheriff becoming involved at an unduly early stage in the process. Amendments 416, 417 and 418 are technical amendments to aid interpretation of the bill. Therefore, convener, I ask uh, the committee to support all of those amendments in this group in my name. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no member has indicated a desire to contribute to this particular um, uh, grouping. Uh, for Minister, do you require to wind up? No, I have waive that. Thank, Thank you. you. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 410 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Can I call amendments 411 to 416, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated? And can I invite the Minister to move amendments 411 to 416 on block? Moved on block. Thank you. Can I ask whether any member objects to a single question being put on amendments 411 to 416? 
No member has objected. Therefore, the question is that amendments 411 to 416 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. The question is that section 69 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Can I call amendment 417 in the name of the Minister? Already debated with amendment 410. Minister, to move formally. Moved. The question is that amendment 417 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Good agreed. The question is that section 70 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Uh, can I call Amendment 418 in the name of the Minister? Already debated with Amendment 410. Minister, to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 418 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? It's agreed. Can I call Amendment 419 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 420 and 430? Minister, to move Amendment 419 and speak to other amendments in the group. Thank you. I move Amendment 419 in my name. Amendments 419 and 420 bring the appeal process created by Section 44A of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995 as inserted by Section 71 of the Bill in relation to situations where a child has been placed in secure accommodation following the making of an order by a sheriff under Section 44 of the Act into line with the relevant parts of the appeal process set out in the Children's Hearing Scotland Act 2011 and subordinate legislation made under that Act. Amendment 419 provides that an appeal under the new section 44A may be made jointly by the child and one or more relevant persons or by two or more relevant persons and that the appeal must not be held in open court. Amendment 420 provides that a relevant person in relation to a section 44A appeal is a relevant person for the purpose of the 2011 Act and includes a person who has been deemed to be a relevant person. Amendment 430 is a minor technical amendment to correct a small error in an amendment made by the recent Section 104 order in consequence of the Children's Hearing Scotland 2011 Act. It clarifies that each reference to the 2000 Act in the definition of secure accommodation in Section 4411 of the Criminal Procedures Scotland Act 1995, as amended by the 104 order, is to the Care Standards Act 2000. So I ask uh, that the committee supports amendments 419, 420 and 430 in my name. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, no other member has indicated a desire to contribute. Uh, Minister, do you wish to wind up? Yes, no, thank, thank you. you. The question is that Amendment 419 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. Can I call Amendment 420 in the name of the Minister? Already debated with Amendment 419. Uh, Minister, to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 420 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. The question is that Section 71 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Can I call Amendment 421 in the name of the Minister? in a group on its own, Minister, to move and speak to the amendment. Thank you. I move Amendment 421 in my name. This amendment adds a new Section 28LA to the Legal Aid Scotland Act 1986, allowing Scottish ministers to make regulations extending the availability of children's legal aid for court proceedings in that Act. This addresses concerns raised by stakeholders during consultation on the draft Children's Legal Assistance Scotland Regulations 2013, about when children's legal aid can and cannot be extended under the existing powers and ensures that children's legal aid can be made available to more people in the future where that is appropriate. It's important that children's legal aid can be made available to those individuals who need it for proceedings under the Children's Hearing Scotland Act 2011. Most commonly, applicants for children's legal aid will be children and relevant persons as described by the 2011 Act. Discussion with stakeholders has shown that children's legal aid may also need to be made available to other people, including for court proceedings. This requires flexibility to lay regulations to make legal aid available where further discussion shows this should be the case. Similarly, the eligibility test for making legal aid generally available must be equitable and consistent. Children's legal aid is no different. Where the circumstances are the same, the same test should apply. This amendment achieves both of those aims. It allows flexibility to make children's legal aid more widely available where that is appropriate, and it does so in a way that is consistent with existing children's legal aid provisions. Therefore, I would ask the committee to support those amendments. Uh, thank you very much. I call Liam MacArthur. Very briefly, uh, convener, I'm certainly very supportive of the, the, the proposals in, in this group, in particular Amendment 421. I just wonder, in the context of um, the financial memorandum, whether any calculation <coughs> be made about the impact that these provisions would have on the overall legal aid uh, budget. I, I mean, I think particularly in light of what we all understand are quite serious pressures on that budget already. That, yeah, there would have to be. Sorry, sorry. Thank you, Mr. McArthur. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Uh, do you think any other member has indicated they wish to contribute? Uh, would the minister wish to wind up? 
Yeah, and uh, thanks, sorry. sorry for being premature there, uh, uh, convener. Yeah, I uh, take on board the points that Lee MacArthur made, and there will be uh, a supplementary financial memorandum to accompany some of the, the changes that have been made as a result of uh, the amendments that have been agreed, not just in this, but to other areas as well. Thank you, Minister. Um, the question is that Amendment 421 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? They're agreed. Can I call Amendment 422 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendment 431? Minister, to move Amendment 422 and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. I move Amendment 422 in my name. Amendment 422 seeks to remove outdated restrictions linked to the participation of children under the age of 14 in performances by repealing Section 38 of the Children and Young Persons Act 1963. Amendment 431 is a minor repeal in consequence of Amendment 422. You'll be aware that I wrote to the committee uh, on the 13th of January, uh, setting out the background to the proposals in this area. The arrangements for licensing children to participate in performances, whether on stage or on screen, are long-standing and in need of modernisation. The vast majority of the changes we need to make can be delivered through second, revised secondary legislation and we'll shortly be publishing a consultation paper setting out what those should look like. However, in December, it became clear that Scotland could potentially be negatively impacted upon by changes being proposed by way of an amendment to the UK Government's Children and Families Bill, which is currently before the House of Lords. An amendment to that bill will remove restrictions which limit the types of performance that children aged under 14 can be involved in across England and Wales by repealing Section 38 of the Children and Young Persons Act 1963. As a result, Scotland could be placed at a potential disadvantage, both in terms of the opportunities presented for our young people and for our creative industries if a similar change were not to be pursued here. Of course, our young people's wellbeing must always be our primary consideration and we would not be proposing the removal of this rule if there were concerns that it could result in children being placed at risk. However, the rule does seem arbitrary and unnecessary given the broader licensing arrangements which exist for all children below school leaving age. All licensing decisions taken by a local authority should be based on a thorough assessment of a child's circumstances and not simply on their age. Indeed, it's this type of child-centred approach that we should be taking to all decisions imp impacting upon our young people. Unfortunately, the timing of the UK Bill amendment has left us with very little scope for consultation on the changes being suggested. However, throughout December, we sought views from a number of key organisations. Those included the Scottish Youth Theatre, Bernardo Scotland, Glasgow City Council, BBC Scotland, and Ofcom, all of whom were supportive of the removal of the under-14 rule. My officials have also written to COSLA on the matter and no concerns from them have been raised. Uh, taking the above into account, therefore, I hope the committee is satisfied as to the merits of making the change and would encourage you to uh, support the amendments in my name. Thank you very much. Um, no members indicated to wish to contribute. Can I maybe, just for absolute clarity, Minister, for my own interest, um, could you uh, reassure the committee um, that uh, this in no way affects the protection of children? Um, clearly, this rule was put in place some time ago, but for good reason. Um, and I just want to be reassured that uh, this section 38 of the Children and Young Persons Act 1963 is repealed, then effectively the proper protections for young people and children who are uh, taking part in artistic performances um, will still be properly protected. No, I, I absolutely um, believe that this will in no way um, affect a child's wellbeing, and the child's wellbeing is paramount, not only in this amendment, but throughout the whole course of the bill. We've already taken um, um, views from a number of stakeholders, those included uh, Bernardo's, not just those with, a, with an interest in, in performance, and no, re, no issues have been raised by, by COSLA, uh, and also we'll be able to continue to look at this through the kind of consultation and engagement uh, for secondary legislation that will be required. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, the question, therefore, is that Amendment 422 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. Can I call Amendment 433 in the name of Alex Johnson and, and a group on its own? Alex Johnson to move and speak to the amendment. Thank you very much, Convener. Members will instantly recognise 433 as a blunt instrument, uh, and they will be equally unsurprised at the fact that this is my weapon of choice. The amendment has been lodged in the context of the Marriage and Civil Partnership Scotland Bill and the need to ensure that children are educated in line with their parents' wishes. The amendment would apply to sex education across the board. However, it is the uh, introduction of same-sex marriage which makes the, it necessary at this time. 
The Marriage and Civil Partnership Act uh, Bill is undoubtedly a controversial issue, and it is therefore paramount that the rights of parents as to what their children are taught are fully protected. It is, of course, correct that children be taught the law of the land, regardless of what, whether they, their parents or their teachers agree with it. This is not in dispute. However, this is very different from the lessons which essentially endorse or promote a particular lifestyle to which many parents may have a sincere moral objection, such as same-sex marriage. The Scottish Government appears to concede the need for safeguards in this area. Uh, it did so in July 2012 when it promised that the consultation would, and I quote, consider any additional measure that may be required to guarantee freedom of speech and religion in specific circumstances, including education. This is therefore, uh, unfortunately, it's therefore unfortunate that this area has been neglected by the Bill itself. The Scottish Government's approach is to rely on guidance. Guidance, however, is in the eyes of many insufficient. Many parents, because of their religious or other convictions, will not want their children to learn about same-sex marriage before a certain age, fearing that they will find it confusing. Others may be concerned that teaching on the subject will not be balanced or will not respect their own convictions on the matter. There is a danger that without a strengthening of the right of withdrawal and placing it on a statutory footing, that the deeply held beliefs of parents will be undermined by their ability to have their children educated in accordance, inability to have their edu uh, children educated in accordance with their own convictions, as is the, the right in Article 2 of the first protocol of the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, they fear this may be infringed. Uh, in moving this amendment, uh, I would like to hear the Minister's views on whether there is a problem here, how the Minister uh, has satisfied herself that the undertaking given, given previously in 2012 uh, has been satisfied by the nature of the bill that has been br brought forward. Finally, I am aware that there are more than one option uh, to deal with this circumstance. There are other suggested routes which may yet be explored, uh, and I therefore look forward to hearing what the Minister has to say so that I can then decide how I might take this matter forward during the process of the Bill. Thank you very much, Mr Johnson. Can I call uh, Neil Bibby? Thanks, Convener. Clearly, this is a, a difficult question, and it is a question of competing rights. In terms of the child, he or she has a right to education uh, about their uh, own health. The number of teenage pregnancies and sexually transmitted diseases uh, are on the rise in, in some areas. And I think it would be difficult to say to a 15-year-old who is capable of making their own decisions and who may well be, uh, we don't know, sexually active, that they cannot attend sex education or to tell them it is not in their best interest to do so. However, having said that, as Alex uh, Johnston has said, there is also a right to pri private family uh, beliefs and, and, and rights of a child to be raised uh, in a religious family um, with uh, certain views. I think the, the decision, therefore, to be made is whether withdrawal from sex education is in the best interests of the child. And I do not believe in, in all probability that it would be in the best interest of the child, and therefore uh, I cannot uh, support Alex Johnston's amendment. Thank you. Can I call Liam MacArthur? Uh, thank you, Convener. I'm uh, aware the government are currently uh, consulting on legislation for, for licensing of, of air guns. I, I am, uh, want to say I have misgivings about aspects of that, but I think we should possibly be looking at the, the licensing of blunt weapons, uh, given uh, Alex uh, Johnston's uh, performance this morning. I can understand the background uh, to why he's uh, raised the concerns he has uh, and the motivation behind it, but I see uh, sex, sex education is an important part of equipping our children and young people with the knowledge they need to make safe, uh, sensible and informed decisions about issues that can uh, quite clearly have a dramatic impact uh, upon their uh, lives. I think there's no dispute that um, development of this uh, education, indeed uh, even aspects of the, the content, should be subject to discussion between uh, schools on the one hand, uh, children and young people and their parents or guardians uh, on the other. And this, I think, um, can helpfully provide uh, reassurance. I think it can also address the, the, the fairly legitimate point that 
that uh, Alex Johnson has raised about ensuring materials that uh, are, are age appropriate uh, in each instance. But ultimately, uh, I think this is a fundamental part of ensuring our children and young people are equipped uh, and empowered uh, to deal with the uh, challenges that life uh, throws up. And, and even then, the safeguards that Alex Johnson uh, wishes to see, I, I believe, are already covered in uh, guidance, as Bar Bernardas have uh, indicated in their briefing. Um, the Scottish Executive Circular uh, to 2001, paragraph 13, states, while it's a nationally accepted part of the existing and agreed curricular framework for Scottish schools and of pupils' at educational uh, entitlement, there is no statutory requirement for participation in a programme of sex education. Schools and authorities must therefore be sensitive to the rare cases in which a parent or carer may wish to withdraw a child from all or part of a planned sex education programme. So I, I understand um, what Mr Johnson is seeking uh, to, to do here um, I, I, and also seeking uh, further assurances, but I do think the amendments uh, in this grouping uh, are not necessary and indeed are, uh, are not helpful in terms of doing what we're all seeking to do through the bill, which is uh, it, it underscoring the rights of children and young people in Scotland. Uh, thank you. Can I call Liz Smith? Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I, I do understand, uh, Mr Johnson, exactly where you are coming from, and I think um, it is appropriate that the Government uh, appreciates that there are concerns, irrespective of what people's views are, uh, that they do understand that there are concerns and whether the existing legislation, whether it comes through uh, this lead committee uh, or any other committee, is not sufficiently tight. So I understand why Mr Johnson has brought this amendment forward. I have concerns about it uh, on the basis that I don't think it necessarily articulates with some of the other uh, current legislation um, and I, I worry that if it was taken uh, in its full context I think we would have a situation where it become very bureaucratic and actually very difficult to spell out exactly what that sex education consisted of um, and so I have some concerns about that and that would be something to be abstaining. Thank you. Can I call George Adam? Thank you, Convener. Uh, it's good to see that uh, Mr Johnson starting the new year uh, being a wee bit more subtle than what he was in the future. Uh, that was sarcasm. <laughs> but uh, on the whole, uh, I can understand where uh, the concerns and the reasoning behind Mr Johnson's amendment. I don't agree with it. I believe there's no definition of any programme of sex education in the amendment. And uh, I remember myself uh, when uh, going through in the 1980s sex education at a difficult time and how it was actually an important part of my own development as a person and as a second time as a parent going through uh, with my two now two 20 something children. Now, the, the, nothing will ever remind me of the time that I had to talk about contraception with my teenage daughter at the time, but it was something that was important. We actually got everything through. So I'm a strong advocate of sexual health education. And I think uh, following the marriage and civil partnership bills, the government thought that they would actually issue guidance and views on their, their seek views. And they're looking, I think guidance myself is probably the best way forward in this issue. And I've got faith that in Scotland's teachers will be able to deal with this issue in a way that will help young people and help them develop as young adults. So I do too like Liam MacArthur don't believe that the amendment is necessary. Thank you very much. Um, if I can make one or two comments myself um, before bringing in the Minister. Um, I very much agree with the comments from a number of members um, this morning um, about the nature of these particular amendments. I, I particularly would uh, re-emphasise the point made by Liam MacArthur about this issue being already covered. Uh, the, there is flexibility in the system at the moment, so they are, I think they are unnecessary. I think also the amendments, as they are laid down, are in fact uh, badly drafted. Um, I have concerns because the motivation appears to be, from my, if I understand Mr Johnson correctly, um, concern about the uh, same-sex marriage issue, which has been debated, obviously, at the moment in the Parliament. Um, however, um, in his own amendment, it talks about uh, the withdrawal of the child from any programme of sex education. Um, so I don't think the motivation that he has uh, laid out um, actually uh, meets with what is in the actual amendment. So I think these two things uh, do not equate. Uh, finally, the, the problem, a point I would like to emphasise, I know other members have mentioned it, is I think this is an extremely important part of, uh, of a young person's health. Um, and this, is, this should not be seen as somehow different from other matters of health education. Uh, young people have a right, uh, irrespective of the balance of privacy and the rights of parents, the young people have a right to understand fully um, the implications of uh, taking on uh, sexual activity and, of course, the impact, possible impacts on their health. Uh, and to deny them that, I think, would be a, a mistake on our part as legislators, and therefore I cannot support these amendments. Uh, Minister. 
Thank you, uh, Convener. Thank you all the, the members for their, their comments. Um, the Government won't, doesn't support the Amendment 433 in Alec Johnson's name, uh, and the Government is a strong believer and advocate of the sexual health uh, education. And Neil Bibby has raised some important points about a right to education, and in this instance about how to develop and enable a young person to develop those appropriate relationships and to keep themselves safe, a point I think, Convener, you made as well in your remarks. Lee MacArthur also uh, made important points about the rights of the child, which is underpinning much of uh, this uh, bill. Uh, and I understand there has been a number of uh, issues raised in debate about the Marriage and Civil Partnerships Bill, and we have sought uh, views on guidance for education authorities and schools to follow. The government believes that parents should be given transparent information about what children should be learning so that parents can offer uh, views and feedback. And that's not just true in relation to sexual health education, but we recognise that this can be a very sensitive area. And so we consider guidance is the best route here and the most appropriate route. Now, I think as Al Alec Johnson uh, suggested in his opening remarks, this is a blunt uh, amendment, and it's not clear what Alec Johnson's amendments includes. Definition of any programme of sex education would need to be included so that members know exactly what they're voting on. I think, again, another point that you raise uh, yourself, uh, convener, and I think also a point that alluded to by, by Elizabeth Smith. So, as I've already said, we have sought views on updated guidance about sexual health education. We've received over 60 responses and are currently considering those responses that we have got. We aim to issue revised guidance towards the end of March and will continue to keep stakeholders informed about progress. And we'll take on board, I'm sure, the points in the, uh, in the debate this morning and take on board the points about the concerns parents have raised here so that we can enable us to strike the right balance when we publish uh, that revised guidance uh, uh, shortly in the springtime. So I would suggest that guidance here is better than legislation, therefore, uh, and for all the reasons that other members have uh, outlined, I do not support Amendment 433 in Alec Johnson's name. Uh, thank you, Minister. Can I call Alec Johnson to wind up and to tell us whether he wishes to press or withdraw his amendment? Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, having heard the discussion that take, has taken place, uh, I have some hope. Uh, I have heard one or two concerns uh, expressed that are in line with those I have expressed myself. However, I am convinced that uh, not everybody around the table fully understands the desire which exists among some parents to ensure that the liberal attitudes that have brought forward the Marriage and Civil Partnership uh, Bill in the first instance are not universally shared. Uh, there is a reluctance uh, among those who support the uh, movement of the bill uh, not to accommodate the broad needs of others. Uh, the discussion, as I said, has not been reassuring. Uh, and as a consequence, I remain very concerned about the position in which uh, some individuals will find themselves as a result of the Marriage and Civil Partnership uh, Bill once it uh, is passed into law. At this stage, uh, given the, the views that have been expressed, uh, I think it's important that I give an undertaking that I will continue to pursue this matter, uh, that I will consult uh, a number of organisations as to how this might be dealt with before this or other legislation reaches stage three. And with that said, I, the, at this moment, seek leave to withdraw Amendment 433. Thank you very much. Are members content for that to be withdrawn? Okay, thank you very much. Therefore, I call Amendment 434 in the name of Liam MacArthur, grouped with Amendments 436 and 437. Liam MacArthur to move Amendment 434 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. The Additional Support for Learning Act was a landmark for our Parliament, a piece of legislation uh, of which we can feel justifiably um, proud, not least the, our uh, predecessor, uh, Education Committee. Uh, the 2004 Act attracted cross-party support and has made a real positive difference to the lives of children and young people, their parents and indeed wider Scottish education. As we have already seen this morning with the rural school closures uh, debate, uh, which is in for an overhaul uh, after less than four years, uh, no legislation is ever perfect. So it is with the ESL Act. Uh, ten years ago, our understanding of the crucial importance of the earliest years in shaping later educational results was less robust and prevention was only starting to become a guiding principle of public policy. Uh, the coalition supporting putting the baby in the bathwater uh, reminds us of three facts in this regard. Firstly, although children are officially covered by this Act from birth, its implementation has not equally benefited children below the age of three. This is reflected in the fact that uh, progress reports have next to nothing to say about children from birth to three with ASL needs. 
On average, approximately 15% of the school age population has established ASL needs, a number that appears to have risen dramatically according to the figures that ministers uh, released uh, in response to a question uh, from me recently. And yet the number and proportion of underage school children having or likely to have ASL needs remains unknown or at least unexplored. Secondly, Scotland does well in identifying dealing with physical conditions suggesting ASL needs that are obvious at or soon after birth. However, uh, many ASL needs, such as those associated with communications difficulties, uh, autism uh, and fetal alcohol harm, develop or, or emerge in the two years between the age of two months, when universal health visiting usually ends, and 27 to 30 months, when the new universal checks will start uh, occurring. This hiatus appears out of step with the whole uh, notion of early, education, uh, early intervention. Some preventable problems are not therefore being prevented just as some concerns that could have been helped through early intervention instead uh, get worse. And finally, we know that this situation happens in part because the SL Act is an education act and was not written with under, age, uh, under school age children in mind. It also happens because the Act's benefits have been limited, unlike for children of any other age, to those eligible under the Disability Discrimination Act. This undermines primary prevention and denies support during most of the first 1,001 days of life when young children and their parents could most effectively and inexpensively be helped through genuinely early intervention. The gap in ASL assessment and provision has not gone unrecognised over the years, but it remains to be closed. Amendment 434 in my name in this grouping offers an opportunity to do so by explicitly including in the ASL Act a duty around prevention in the first 1,001 days of life, which are, after all, the first 1,001 days of learning. As this has been said many times, the, ch the current Children and Young People Bill uh, that we're considering is a starting point. This amendment is an illustration of what could and should happen next in the delivery of the objectives of this bill. Uh, it is also entirely in keeping with the recommendations from the Putting the Baby in the Bathwater report. Uh, I hold out little hope that the amendment will be supported, but would perhaps, uh, in moving it, encourage uh, committee members to see this as uh, unfinished business and perhaps invite the Minister to indicate uh, a commitment uh, to look at ways in which this, this gap uh, can indeed uh, be closed. Amendments briefly 436 and 437 are much simpler ones uh, that enable a named person for an under school age child to request an ASL assessment instead of relying almost entirely on parents to do so. Parental consent would still be required, uh, but not direct parental action. Um, I would urge the committee to support those amendments, but for now I move uh, amendment 434 in my name and look forward to the Minister and other colleagues' response. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Can I call Joan McAlpine? Very much, convener. Yes, I, I would like to um, support uh, the comments that uh, Liam MacArthur has made, and I think um, the, it's an important issue that he raises. And uh, I think we all agree that ESL was a landmark act and has made a positive difference to the lives of many children. However, I do think that what these amendments are trying to achieve is already covered in the existing bill provisions, and every child, including pre-age children will have access to a named person. And where there's a well-being need, the named person can seek to determine how best to support the child, and that, that may well be a coordinated support plan. Uh, so therefore, I'm, while I think it's very important, some of the issues that he's raised, I'm not sure that these amendments are necessary at this stage into this bill. Um, and so therefore, I, I won't be supporting uh, the amendment. Uh, thank you very much. Before I bring in the Minister, can I make one or two comments uh, as well? Um, I am certainly very sympathetic to the argument that Liam MacArthur has just made. I think he makes some very pertinent points um, uh, in defence of his uh, amendments. Um, therefore, um, what I would like to hear from the Minister is a clear statement of um, uh, the Government's view on these amendments um, and whether or not, like uh, Joe McAlpine has outlined, the, the Minister feels that uh, these, are already, these issues are already covered. Um, and perhaps um, a commitment to further discussion in some of, this area, in some of these areas, because I think there is a wider point being made, um, not just in these amendments, but other amendments that we have dealt with um, throughout the bill that I think require further discussion, um, uh, not just today, but uh, with the committee. And um, with that, can I call the Minister? Thank you, uh, Convener. And again, I, th I 
thank uh, Liam MacArthur for the points he's raised and, of course, the, the Baby in the Bathwater Coalition for the amendments that they've brought forward. Now, again, I just want to reiterate that we absolutely support the, prevention of, the, the principle of prevention and early intervention behind all of the amendments, especially where that early intervention might prevent an additional support need developing in the first place or existing additional support needs from worsening. And that, that's why the Children and Young People Bill already contains a number of provisions which focus on early intervention and prevention, a point that's been made by uh, Joan McAlpin. I just want to outline some of the reasons within the bill where we think that's uh, most apparent and then go on to some of the specific requests that uh, Lee MacArthur and Stuart Maxwell have made. Now, a child's health and well-being are assessed from birth during the contact set out in the Child Health Programme, which now includes that 27-30 month universal health review. And where these well-being needs require it, a child's plan will be developed uh, in partnership with the child, their family and relevant professionals. That child's plan will take account of learning needs, and this will ensure that the learning needs of children under school age are met alongside any other needs which may affect their well-being as part of the named person's role to promote support and safeguard children's well-being. Section 24 of the Bill requires service providers to publish information about the named person service and its functions and contact arrangements. And the provision ensures that families are made aware of the most appropriate contact for information. The named person functions also include a duty to advise, inform and support the child and their parents. Section 25 of the Bill requires service providers and relevant authorities where requested to provide assistance to the named person service provider where this would assist the exercise of the named person function. And Section 38 contains a similar duty in respect of child's plans. Therefore, the Bill contains a provision to ensure that relevant information about children's well-being, including any learning needs, is or can be made available to those who require it. More specifically, um, in response to the points raised by uh, Liam MacArthur and Stuart Maxwell, the advisory group for additional support for learning has agreed that the issue of prevention and early intervention through the early years is a very important one. The revision of the statutory code of practice for ASL is already underway, as we wish to be clear about the delivery of additional support for learning in the context of the Children and Young People's Bill. This will specifically include a focus on prevention and early intervention. This revised, revised code of practice will be subject to a full consultation and parliamentary scrutiny as required by Section 27 of the ASL Act. And given the considered and thoughtful input of the Baby in the Bathwater campaign, I know this revision of the code will benefit uh, from the expertise and knowledge of the Baby in the Bathwater Coalition and their input. Um, regarding the collection of data on school-aged children with additional support needs, through the current bill provisions relating to children's plans, local authorities and health boards will be required to report on outcomes prescribed by, the Scot by Scottish ministers. And that will include a number of outcomes related to early intervention and primary prevention activity. Statutory guidance on this part of the bill will be developed, again, in collaboration with a wide range of partners and stakeholders. So for those reasons outlined, uh, and while I do appreciate the points that the member has made, we believe that the amendments are unnecessary, but I hope that um, commitment to full and wide consultation in regard to the uh, revision of the code gives uh, comfort to not only the members, but also to the coalition who have submitted uh, very thought-provoking uh, uh, amendments in this section of the bill. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. Can I call Liam MacArthur and indi indicate whether he wishes uh, to press or withdraw his amendments? Uh, thank you, Convener. Thank you for your comments and Joe McAlpine, the Minister, uh, which I found uh, very encouraging indeed. That this is a, a, a landmark act, as Joe McAlpine uh, indicated, I, and I do think that uh, the bill we're considering at the moment uh, will address a, a number of the concerns that have been raised. But um, I, I think we need to guard against um, any suggestion uh, that with the, the passing of this Act, that is, um, that, that is business done. It's something clearly we're going to have to keep under review. And I, I, I welcome the comment from the Minister in relation to the work of the uh, advisory group and their, uh, their consideration of the uh, statutory code. Uh, and indeed, I think the invitation there for those, the coalition behind the putting the baby in the bathwater uh, to engage directly with that process, which I think uh, will be helpful. I'm conscious we will be discussing our work programme uh, later on uh, this morning. It may be a bit premature uh, for, for this issue to be picked up in that, uh, but certainly there would be an opportunity for us to come back to it in due course. So for the time being, uh, I'm grateful uh, in particular to the Minister for her comments, and on that basis we'll not be pressing uh, Amendment 434. Um, Liam MacArthur has indicated he wishes to withdraw Amendment 434. Members content?
Uh, can I call Amendment uh, 435 in the name of Mary Fee, grouped with Amendment 438. Uh, Mary Fee, to move Amendment 435 and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Amendments 435 and 438 relate to the minimum age at which a young transgender person can apply for a gender recognition certificate, which is currently 18. The lack of gender recognition for 16 and 17 year old transgender people means they are discriminated against compared to other 16 and 17 year olds, including being prevented from marrying in accordance with their gender identity until they are 18. And during stage one of the Marriage and Civil Partnership Scotland Bill, the Equal Opportunities Committee heard evidence on the need to reduce the minimum age for gender recognition from 18 to 16. And in their stage one report, the committee asked the Scottish Government to provide a detailed response. And in that response, the Scottish Government have said that they would need to consult and obtain more evidence on this before making a change. And my amendments would provide exactly for that. They were ruled out of scope for the Marriage and Civil Partnership Bill because they do not relate only to marriage and civil partnership, but they are within the scope of this bill. This is a very important issue for young transgender people. A significant number of young people are diagnosed with gender dysphoria in their early teenage years, and with their parents' support, they transition to live full-time in the opposite gender to their birth certificate. They can change their name on a range of documents, including school reports, medical and dental records, bank records and bus passes. But without a gender recognition certificate, their legal rem gender remains unchanged, which causes significant discrimination in education and employment, for example, when college or job applications are made. People can apply for gender recognition as long as they have a diagnosis of gender dysphoria and have lived in their acquired gender for at least two years. Significant numbers of 16 and 17 year olds qualify but are prevented from, from applying by the minimum age being 18. Changing the application to 16 is supported by the specialist psychiatrist who provides treatment to young transgender people in Scotland. And it's also in line with best practice in other European countries. Amendment 435 provides for a consultation and review on this change. And if the review concludes that a change should be made, the amendment provides for a one-off order-making power for that purpose only. And Amendment 438 makes the order-making power subject to the affirmative procedure. And I believe that a review of this matter is needed and should not be delayed. And young transgender people are facing real discrimination now. And the sooner the issue is sorted out, the better. And I move Amendment 435 in my name and hope the committee can support. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Mary, and congratulations for getting through uh, that. <laughs> um, can I call uh, Liam MacArthur? Thank you very much. Uh, Camera, can I congratulate Mary Fee on bringing the amendments and indeed getting through the process of speaking uh, to them. Uh, I think the, the call for at least a review on the minimum age for applying for gender recognition is, uh, is well made. Uh, reviewing whether or not this limit should be lowered from 18 to 16 or 17, possibly through secondary legislation, seems to me to be perfectly sensible and would go some way to better reflect the needs of young transgender uh, people in Scotland. As LGBT Youth Scotland point out in their briefing, uh, for this morning's proceedings, many transgender young people begin living in their new or acquired gender well before uh, they reach 16, so must live for far longer than the normally required two years in their new gender role without proper legal uh, documentation or recognition. It's not hard to appreciate, as Mary Fee set out, that this can, enforce, uh, this can force those affected to develop a very negative perception of themselves, but also impact adversely on the way that others uh, view them. And I think uh, Mary Fee also set out some of the very practical um, uh, disadvantages that arise uh, from the way in which uh, the law is currently framed. So I would certainly hope that the Minister would, um, uh, if not support the amendments as they currently stand, at least offer uh, a commitment uh, to have this uh, reviewed out with the, the, the context of this bill. And again, thank Mary Fee for, for bringing the amendments this morning. Thank you. Can I call Joan McAlpine? Thank you very much, Mr. 
Lords Convener. I am sympathetic to um, the, the spirit of uh, Mary Fee's amendments, and I would commend the briefing that we received from the Equality Network um, on this subject, um, which covers m many of the comments that Mary Fee has already made. It certainly, um, I learned a lot from, from reading the briefing, and it's obviously a very, a very sensitive and, and very important issue for those who are affected. However, the fact that I learned so much from reading the briefing when we as a committee hadn't actually heard any of this evidence makes me uncomfortable about supporting the amendments because I think the way that you pass legislation and the way that the committee should work is that we should be able to take evidence uh, on a subject, and this particular subject is as important as this, uh, b before making a change to the law. But I too would welcome uh, the Minister's comments on this, and I, as I say, I do support the spirit of the, the amendment and the organisations that have argued in favour of it. Thank you. Can I call Liz Smith? Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I think I understand the uh, basis for uh, putting forward these amendments um, because there are quite clearly some uh, discrimination issues that we have to address. Uh, I do have concerns, however, about the whole application of 16 to 18 legislation in this Parliament just now, whether it's uh, within this committee uh, or not. I don't think we've got uh, a situation where we're entirely consistent. Uh, so I, I hope that that's something that can be addressed um, in terms of whether or not we take this forward. I think there is a debate to be had, not just about the merits uh, of this particular amendment, but actually where we sit with 16 to 18 uh, legislation, because there are lots of inconsistencies just now. And so on that basis, I'm not comfortable about uh, voting uh, for this amendment, nothing to do with the discrimination aspect, but because I'm not comfortable about the consistency of our legislative process at the present time. Uh, thank you very much. Um... If nobody else wishes to contribute, I will um, make a few remarks myself. Um, I think very, very fairly, Mary Fee has brought forward an issue which has, uh, it does need to be addressed, I think it's fair to say. Um, I think the problem I personally face with supporting these amendments is a, a lack of background knowledge and information and evidence that this committee has received throughout this process. This has come to this committee, certainly, um, out of left field, if I can put it now, it's very, it's very certainly uh, very new to this committee, and certainly personally, I'm unaware of the detail and the arguments, um, both in favour and against uh, such a change. Um, however, I think that probably this issue has to be properly debated and argued through, um, and I certainly, again, like others, would be very interested to hear what the, the government's position is on it. Um, I'm very sympathetic to making sure we do remove discrimination if such discrimination exists, but I feel at this stage. Unfortunately, I can't support these amendments because of that lack of uh, background evidence that uh, we, uh, we have not had um, uh, while we've been going through the process of looking at this particular bill, and that leaves me in some difficulty in supporting the amendments as they stand. Uh, therefore, can I call the Minister? Thank you, uh, Convener, and thank, uh, to thank Mary Fee as well for uh, battling through what's clearly a very sore throat in terms of moving this amendment. Now, the issue of reducing the application age for gender recognition arose, as has been outlined by members, uh, through the context of the Marriage and Civil Partnerships Bill, which is also making its way through Parliament, and that this amendment is deemed to be out with the scope of that bill. Now, as Mary Fee's uh, comments have suggested, this is an incredibly sensitive issue, and the young people that Mary Fee has mentioned can face very difficult and uncertain circumstances, and it's critical that we make the right legislative choices and have the, the right understanding to support all those facing those important decisions about their life. But we don't believe that it's the right point to make those choices, uh, nor that the Children and Young People Bill is the best place to do this. We understand the points made in evidence given to the Equal Ops Committee where this was first raised. Equally, though, the government considers it premature to take an order-making power now. This wasn't raised, as I think, Convener, you mentioned in the original consultation on the Children and Young People Bill or in the Committee Stage 1's uh, evidence uh, gathering sessions. We think it would be responsible to consult and seek expert advice on this issue, as Joan McAlpine uh, outlined, and that it would, of course, that consultation uh, would include um, expert groups such as the equalities groups that have provided briefing to committee members. Under the current requirements of the 2004 Act, a person normally has to live in the acquired gender for two years before applying to the Gender Recognition Panel, and that means children would have to start living in the acquired gender at 14 to be able to apply at 16, and that raises questions about the support and advice which is available to people of that age that deserves far more detailed uh, and careful consideration. And I think Liz Smith also raises some important issues about the wider context of the Bill. 
Policy responsibility rests with my health colleagues and understand that the Qualities Minister will carefully and seriously consider representations that are made on this issue and will not forget the points that have been raised and raised well here. And we will ensure that the Qualities Minister is updated about today's debate and the points that have been made and, of course, the submissions that have been presented by the Qualities uh, Group. So, in the meantime, however, we can't support the amendments that Mary Fee uh, has submitted and would invite her to withdraw them. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, can I call Mary Fee to wind up and to indicate whether she wishes to press or withdraw her amendments? Can I thank uh, both the, 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 the Minister and members in the committee for um, the comments that they have made this morning and for their understanding of what is a very sensitive um, subject. Um, I am slightly disappointed that there wasn't a greater commitment to um, review this in, in, in some way. I do take on board the comments that the Minister made about the Equalities Minister looking um, at this issue. And I, I suppose if I could get a further assurance that um, this matter will be taken seriously and will be further consulted, I would be happy to withdraw this amendment if I can get a further commitment to that. I think, for, on the record, I did say that this mm. would be seriously considered by the Qualities mm. Minister and that we would be making sure that all the points raised today would be raised with her. Yeah. Yeah. On that basis, I'm happy to withdraw 435. Okay, the member has um, requested to withdraw uh, Amendment uh, 435. Are members content? Thank you. Uh, can I call Amendment 423 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary? Already debated with Amendment 405. Minister, to move formally? Move formally. The question is that Amendment 423 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That's agreed. Can I call Amendment 381 to 385, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated? Min invite Minister to move Amendments 381 to 385 on block. Moved on block. Can I ask whether any member objects to a single question being put on Amendments 381 to 385? Uh, no member has objected. Therefore, the question is that Amendments 381 to 385 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. The question is that Section 73 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. Can I call Amendment 254 in the name of Jane Baxter, already debated with Amendment 216? Jane Baxter, to move or not move? Move, Convener. That's moved. Uh, therefore, the question is that Amendment 254 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Uh, we are not all agreed. Therefore, there will be a division. Um, would all those members who wish to support Amendment 254 please show? Thank you. Uh, those against? Thank you. Okay, the result of the vote on Amendment 254, there were two votes uh, in favour and six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. Can I call Amendment 255 in the name of Jane Baxter? Already debated with Amendment 216. Jane Baxter, to move or not move? Move, convener. Thanks. That's moved. The question is that Amendment 255 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're not all agreed. Therefore, there will be a division. Uh, those members who wish to support Amendment 255, please show. Thank you. Those against? Thank you. The result of the vote on Amendment 255, two votes in favour, six votes against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The question is that Section 74 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes, we are. I call Amendment 82 in the name of Liz Smith in a group on its own. Liz Smith to move and speak to, amendment, to the amendment. Uh, thank you, Convener. I, I think this committee knows uh, better than any other committee in the Parliament the outstanding work that voluntary organisations do when they support the development of children and young people. And it's a result of their very important and highly informative insistence that I'm bringing forward Amendment 82. Its purpose is to enable the Scottish Government to provide voluntary bodies with either general or particular guidance after consulting with them beforehand. This recognises the unique role of voluntary bodies when they uh, are assisting development. For instance, guidance issued to local authorities is sometimes not appropriate uh, or consistent with that required for voluntary bodies. Its demands might be too onerous or take up very scarce resources, which voluntary organisations don't actually have, and at times where they are best deployed elsewhere. Amendment 82 would prevent such problems from arising by creating a separate avenue through which distinct guidance can emerge. In turn, this would ensure that voluntary bodies always have a voice in the process of de developing uh, issues relating to children and young people, 
Uh, as it stands, I think we are all aware that they are very nervous that their interests will not always be adequately reflected and that guidance sometimes fails to take into account their special role and circumstances. Amendment 82 is designed to address these concerns head on and go a long way to re reassuring voluntary bodies that their specific role and character will be taken into account. So I move Amendment 82. Thank you. Can I call Liam MacArthur? Just very briefly, um, convener, I mean, certainly uh, I can think of a few others uh, that are impacted quite as much as voluntary the voluntary organisations or indeed the third sector more widely uh, by this bill and indeed the extent to which this bill relies on the, or will rely on the voluntary sector in terms of delivering its objective. I think Liz Smith makes a fair point about uh, guidance more generally for, for public bodies not necessarily being uh, entirely applicable uh, in the context of voluntary organisations. So uh, Amendment 82 uh, appears to me a sensible addition to the bill that will allow ministers uh, to provide more specific um, uh, guidance where it's appropriate. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can I call the minister? Uh, thank you, convener. And I echo the views of Liz Smith that the voluntary sector is unique and plays an important role in services and development of policy. And that's why the voluntary sector as a whole is actively engaged in all aspects of the Children and Young People Bill, including the development of guidance. And we've said that a number of times as well, that we would want to consult with uh, those people as we um, progress with the implementation of this bill. Third sector organisations are represented at all levels of consultation and policy development. The use of the term voluntary organisation is, though we believe imprecise, and does not reflect the complexity and range of provision of children's services by non-public sector organisations, which includes voluntary, charitable, social enterprises, non-governmental and private sector organisations. Inclusion of the term voluntary organisations would require a legal definition and an intended consultation with the sector to agree on that uh, definition. Previous discussions and consultations on that issue have resulted in general agreement on the term third sector, which is now generally accepted. Traditionally, the third sector has also valued its independence. Specific reference on the face of a government bill potentially could undermine uh, that and would not be welcomed by all parties within the sector. Scottish Ministers can at any time issue non-statutory guidance to voluntary organisations about the application of the Act to them, and so this can be achieved without the need of, for Amendment 82. Therefore, I would urge the Member not to move uh, these amendments. Thank you. Can I call Liz Smith to wind up and to indicate whether she wishes to press or withdraw the amendment? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Convener. I, I, I think um, I've listened to what the Minister said on that basis, but I think the reason for the amendment was brought uh, on the basis because of the uh, lobbying consultations that were taking place with many who are in the third sector, all the voluntary <coughs> organisations, and they are very clear indeed um, that at present uh, they do not have the clarity that is required uh, when it comes to the uh, roles that they will have uh, in how they proceed uh, when it comes to children and young people. So I think we have to be extremely clear that we're giving them that guidance. I'm not convinced at present that the, the guidance is sufficient to make it clear from a government level uh, to these organisations exactly what is expected for them and where their role actually lies. And that's the reason, as I say, for the amendment. So I will press it. Okay, thank you. The question is that Amendment 82 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not. Therefore, there will be a division. Uh, those members who wish to support Amendment 82, please show. Thank you. Uh, those against? The result of the vote on Amendment 82, three votes in favour, four votes against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. Can I call Amendment 256 in the name of Jane Baxter? Already debated with Amendment 216. Jane Baxter, to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 256 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not. Therefore, there is a division. Uh, those members who wish to support Amendment 256, please show. Thank you. Those against? Uh, the result of the vote on Amendment 256, there was one vote in favour and six votes against. Therefore, the amendment is not agreed to. Can I call Amendment 386 in the name of the Minister? Already debated with Amendment 332 on Day 3. Minister, to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 386 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. The question is that Section 75 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that Section 76 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. Can I call Amendment 424 in the name of the Minister? Group with Amendments 425, 426, 387, 427, 428 and 429. 
Minister to move Amendment 424 and speak to other amendments in the group. Thank you. I uh, move Amendment 424. In my name, Amendments 424 and 425 are minor technical drafting amendments consequential upon the Children's Hearing Scotland Act 2011, which came into force after the introduction of the Bill. Amendment 427 is, a consequen is consequential on the changes made by Amendments 424 and 425. Amendment 426 makes two minor consequential amendments in relation to legal aid, uh, legal aid as a result of Amendments 412, 432 and 421 in previous groups. This amendment will ensure that legal aid is available for appeals against the decision that a person previously deemed to be a relevant person is no longer deemed uh, a relevant person under the Children's Hearing Scotland Act 2011. This amendment will also ensure that affirmative procedures apply to the new section 28LA powers to be inserted by Amendment 421. Amendment 387 makes an amendment to section 20 of the Children's Scotland Act 1995 in consequence of provisions in the Bill on Counselling Services and Kinship Care Orders. Under section 20 of the 1995 Act, local authorities must from time to time prepare and publish information about relevant services they provide. Amendment 387 extends the definition of relevant services to cover services provided by local authorities for and respect of children in their area under Parts 9, Counselling and 10, Kinship Care Order. This is a technical amendment to ensure that local authorities publish information about the kinship care assistance and counselling services they provide alongside information about other services which support children and families and promote their wellbeing. Amendments 428 and 429 are two minor drafting amendments to make small adjustments to the text of an amendment being made by paragraph 34 of Schedule 4 to the Bill to Section 44.1 of the Children's Scotland Act 1995. Section 44 of the 1995 Act makes provision for publishing restrictions in relation to certain proceedings involving children. The amendment aligns the, wor the wording in new section 44.1a of the 1995 Act with an amendment previously made to that section by uh, section 52a of the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2003 to ensure drafting cons uh, consistency. Therefore, we ask uh, the committee to support the amendments in this group in my name. Uh, thank you very much. No member has indicated they wish to uh, contribute at this stage, Minister. I presume you don't wish to wind up. Uh -huh. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 424 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Can I call Amendment 424? I'll, I'll do it again for clarity. The question is that Amendment 424 be agreed to. Yes. We are agreed. Okay, thank you. Can I call Amendment 425, 426, 387 and 427 to 431, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated? Can I invite the Minister to move these amendments on block? Moved on block. Can I ask whether any member objects to a single question being put on these amendments? There has been no objection. Therefore, the question is that amendments 425, 426, 387 and 427 to 431 are agreed. Are we all agreed? We are. Can I call amendment 436 in the name of Liam MacArthur? Already debated with amendment 434. Liam MacArthur to move or not move? Not moved. Can I call Amendment 437 in the name of Liam MacArthur? Already debated with Amendment 434. Liam MacArthur to move or not move? Moved. Not moved. Can I call Amendment 432 in the name of the Minister? Already debated with Amendment 410. Minister to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 432 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Are we all agreed? We are. Thank you. The question is that Schedule 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Can I call Amendment 117, 311, 313 to 315, 388 and 389, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. And can I invite the Minister to move these amendments uh, on block? Moved on block. Uh, can I ask whether any member objects to a single question being put on these amendments? Nope. Uh, nobody objects. Therefore, the question is that Amendments 117, 311, 313 to 315, 388 and 389 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. Can I call Amendment 438 in the name of Mary Fee, already debated with Amendment 435. Mary Fee to move or not move? Based on the comments that the Minister made earlier, I'm content not to move it. It's not moved, thank you. Um, the question is that Section 77 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Call Amendment 118 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 95 in Day 1. Minister to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 118 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That's agreed. The question is that Sections 78 to 80 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. The 
question is that the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. That ends stage two consideration of the bill. Can I thank all members who lodged amendments to the bill? Uh, they have indeed contributed to what has been a substantial period of scrutiny. And can I also thank the Minister uh, and, of course, her accompanying officials and the Cabinet Secretary who came along this morning for their contribution to stage two. We now move to consideration of the bill at stage three. The timing for stage three proceedings will be confirmed soon. And we will, of course, publish details on the committee's web page. Thank you very much, Minister. Can I move to agenda item two uh, on this morning's uh, agenda? Our next item today is to consider the Colleges of Further Education Transfer and Closure Scotland Order 2013. And, um, so, sorry, so, so, excuse me, Minister and Miss, Mrs Fee, Minister, so if you could just have a little bit of quiet, please. You can leave, but uh, it's just a, the noise of the conversation was rather loud. Our next item today is to consider the Colleges of Further Education Transfer and Closure, Scotland Order 2013. A number of colleges have exercised their powers to transfer property and rights to other colleges. The order closes the colleges and transfers any residual property and rights to other recipient colleges. Therefore, do members have any comments they wish to make on the instrument? Uh, does the committee therefore agree to make no recommendation to the Parliament on the instrument? Agreed. Thank you. Uh, agenda item three or is our final item today, uh, and it is to decide whether to take business in private at future meetings. Uh, specifically, uh, we are invited to agree to take the following items in private. Our work programme. Secondly, correspondence in relation to school closures. And thirdly, correspondence from the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee on its inquiry into the legislative process. Do members agree? Agreed. Uh, thank you very much. Can I thank everybody uh, once again for their uh, dedication and hard work through the Stage 2 process of the Children and Young People of Scotland Bill, uh, and I close the meeting. Thank you.